Oliveira and brother Pedro Oliveira. The theme, as you all know, is discovering divine wisdom. And the book for study is Seeking Wisdom by a brother N. Sri Ram, former president of Theosophical Society. The program is scheduled as follows. So there will be the first session of 40 to 45 minutes by Sister Linda, followed by Q and A, and then we'll have a five minute break. And then the session two will be taken by brother Pedro for again, 40 to 45 minutes, followed by questions and answers. So now I would like to invite Sister Linda Oliveira for the universal invocation. And before that, I would like to request all the participants to kindly mute their microphones. Over to you, Sister Linda. Oh, hidden life, vibrant in every atom. Oh, hidden light, shining in every creature. Oh, hidden love, embracing all in oneness. May each who feels himself as one with thee know he is therefore one with every other. Thank you, Sister Linda. So now we shall begin the study session and I would like to invite Sister Linda for the first session. Over to you, Sister. Thank you, Sister. And, and also to the Indian section for the opportunity for us to conduct these classes over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we now come to the final day of classes and uh, I'm going to be dealing today with chapter 14 of the book, Seeking Wisdom, which is called The Three Paths in One. It occurred to me also, thinking about seeking wisdom, that in a sense that that is very much part of the purpose of human evolution, part of the purpose of the human being really, uh, to uh, bring the consciousness to a state of wisdom. When we think of the word theosophy, it comes from the Greek theosophia, meaning divine wisdom. And we can think of our, as theosophy both as a set of teachings from one point of view, but also as a state of consciousness. So to be in a state of divine wisdom uh, is to be in a truly blessed state. So let us now have a look at chapter 14 of the book, The Three Paths in One. We will just bring up some slides again. So in this chapter, we move into the yoga tradition, particularly uh, with some reference during the chapter to the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, the Lord's Song, which of course forms a, a quite a portion of the great Hindu epic, the Mahabharata. When we think about yoga today, there are so many different types of yoga around. People are offering courses on this and that. Um, we can have jnana yoga, uh, karma, bhakti yoga, Hatha yoga, um, Raja yoga, Brahma yoga. There are different types of yogas. Um, Ashtanga yoga, hot yoga. Many things are available certainly in the West as well under the name of yoga. Uh, but here we are focused in a specific way, more in terms of classical yoga in the Hindu tradition. Brother Sri Ram acknowledges that in the text we are studying, uh, in this text we are studying that 18 different types of yoga are of course uh, spelt out in the Bhagavad Gita. Each of the 18 chapters 
is summed up as uh, being described by a kind of yoga. He commences by pointing out the generally accepted religious view in the Indian religious tradition that there are three paths to the highest human goal, those of wisdom, of action and devotion, and that each of these is described as a kind of yoga. So of course, this brings up the question of what the term yoga means, what it implies. Uh, of course, it's derived from the verbal root yuj, to join or to yoke together or to unite. Uh, so we can think of it as a kind of a, a union, uh, a conjunction or a merging or a joining together. So when one is in a state of true uh, yoga, one is in a state of union, that is union with all of life. Um, union uh, can be associated with unity or um, with, with fusion, with, with a, a tremendously profound state of harmony uh, and also with a seamlessness as well so that there is no, there is no gap. One is completely uh, joined, if you like, with the universe at that moment. A few words by Sri Krishna Prem on the Bhagavad Gita and yoga before we proceed. He describes the Gita as a textbook of yoga, a guide to the treading of the path, that which we refer to, of course, as the spiritual path. To him, yoga is the path by which man unites his finite self with infinite being. Our finite existence is united with the infinite. And it is the inner path of which all these separate yogas are all so many one-sided aspects. So one can think about this um, path of yoga as something which uh, other paths lead to and that that is this path that will bring us ultimately to union union I suppose when we think about the world today so many people are following different so-called paths of a, a, a spiritual nature of one sort or another uh, but which ultimately uh, would lead to this spiritual path itself uh, which is referred to, of course, in modern theosophical literature. Brother Sri Ram puts it in this way. He said that all of these so-called different paths actually merge into one. So we could imagine a set of paths with arrows all leading together to one point, and then there is this one path at, at that stage. So it's always useful to put things in a slightly broader context. Now, in the text, we then proceed to the question of what action means and what it implies. So, of course, we need to think about, therefore, what is action? Well, action implies doing, it implies energy, uh, it implies work. So let us therefore turn for a few moments to the term karma, which comes, of course, from the root kri, to do or to make. So karma we can think of as being associated with all action, all motion, all doing. Uh, it has a form, uh, that is the, the action itself, but there's also a consciousness aspect of karma, which we know as the law of karma. So from a consciousness point of view, it is also a universal and intelligent law. So if we think of human laws, for example, we tend to think of certain rules that are used for control. 
countries throughout the world have certain laws which are supposed to be followed. But karma, it is suggested, is a natural law which is different. It is not made by human beings. It is kind of a regular pattern in nature, like gravity, for example. So karma denotes both all modes of action, all types of action, as well as that law which adjusts causes to effects. Action therefore includes whatever actions we carry out on all levels of our being and the intelligent and divine response to those actions. And we, we do act uh, in many ways. We don't just act physically, but from moment to moment, we are also acting mentally and usually that is associated with emotions in some way. So action is going on all the time, uh, both in terms of what we do in the outer world, our movements, uh, our, our relationships, uh, what we say and all of that, what we are doing at a given time, but also there is that interior aspect of action in relation to human beings. So it's quite interesting to think about how strongly karma op operates in our lives, both in terms of actions and the law uh, which is behind those actions. Um, I, I have a, a friend who once said, uh, perhaps partly joking, that he was having a karmic sabbatical in this incarnation, implying that, uh, well, from his point of view, he didn't have um, any close family members alive. He didn't have a family or children or anything like that. So he described that as a karmic sabbatical, meaning a holiday from karma. Uh, but, of course, we cannot escape karma. Uh, we cannot escape that law of karma. It is there all the time. Brother Sri Ram shares some reflections on the nature of action in the chapter that we are considering. He notes that one can be very active from year to year. So there is motion. However, he says one may not feel that anything important has been achieved or there may be a feeling of frustration or, per, for example, one might make a New Year's resolution but not stick to that resolution. Perhaps many people do that. They decide, well, this year I'm going to do this in my life to improve things or whatever, but many people do not actually hold to these resolutions. So um, act action requires will really when it's really um, directed and focused action and many people are lacking in willpower. And sometimes also people delay things they don't want to do, uh, but eventually uh, circumstances catch up with them anyway. He continues that if the action is of the right quality, it should not give rise to such a feeling of frustration or lack of achieving anything important. So action can be such that we are not concerned with the results. And he says in that case, the action has been more superficial, more mechanical, uh, not, not really intentional action, if you like. So what happens when something becomes mechanical? The yoga of action said Brother Sri Ram, may involve just going round and round doing the same old things. Tiredness may occur. He writes, when action becomes mechanical, it loses its grace. It becomes lifeless and extremely limited in its effect. And we can, I think, relate to this because Certain actions in life can become very mechanical. For a person who drives a car or a motor scooter, for example, 
um, the learning is there. The person learns how to do this, but then after that it becomes quite a mechanical thing, almost automatic, because the process is known. But let's think about things like, for example, performing ritual, um, perhaps a puja, or um, perhaps in, in a Christian church doing some sort of ritual. Uh, some people are interested in masonry and they undertake Masonic rituals. But ritual can become mechanical if one is not careful. So it needs to be, those actions need to be approached with real intent and, and really a sense of the sacred work that is being undertaken. Or we might uh, read over something we have read many times before and not see anything new there. Or we might listen, as it were, mechanically to somebody else. Uh, we're not really listening with all of ourselves. So mechanical action is one thing. Brother Sri Ram noted that when a person has a, self in, a sense of self-importance in the work, there may be enthusiasm, but that enthusiasm might only be there when one holds a certain position. Uh, some people uh, seem to hold great importance to holding a position. Ideally, to undertake faithfully the yoga of action, everything that we do should be done well. Everything that we do should be done well. There is an old saying, if a thing is worth doing, it is worth doing well. And there's a certain wisdom in that as well. And this can apply either to small things or to larger things. It can also apply very much, for example, to the service we give to the TS. Uh, is this done in a haphazard way or is it done well? Are we really endeavouring to, uh, to bring the best of ourselves to the work we are doing? And this can apply whether we are welcoming newcomers, for example, to a lodge meeting or giving a talk or working on a committee, anything that needs to be done uh, to help. That reminds me of a story I heard when I was at Hyderabad at one stage. I think it was Hyderabad anyway. There was a gentleman who was... Um, had joined the TS and I was talking to him and asked him what made him join the Theosophical Society and he told me he had seen, he had walked past this place quite a few times and seeing somebody outside just carefully sweeping the footpath outside. And eventually he came inside and discovered it was the Theosophical Society and that that person was in fact the president of that lodge for whom a small task was not too small. And he wanted, um, I guess, the path to look its best for um, outside the lodge and, and that was what he did. So that was really quite uh, an interesting story. Actions which are done well are really a genuine yoga of action because they, they are uh, based on not just ourselves and wanting to get something finished, but, but based out of a, a sort of a concern for the whole, a, a concern for something larger than ourselves. And then we move to one of the most fundamental teachings in the Bhagavad Gita. And this really relates to pure action. Whose works are all free from the moulding of desire, whose actions are burned up by the fire of wisdom, him the wise have called the sage. Having abandoned attachment to the fruit of action, 
always content, nowhere seeking refuge, he is not doing anything, although doing actions. And then a couple of verses on, it says, content with whatsoever he obtaineth without effort, free from the pairs of opposites, without envy, balanced in success and failure, though acting, he is not bound. And this is really a very high ideal, isn't it? To just act without desire for the result. To be content. Uh, and content with whatever is obtained without effort. To be free from those pairs of opposites, to be in a state of equilibrium. Without envy not concerned whether one succeeds or fails. This is all very much about pure action, which is a high ideal towards which may, we may aspire. And again, an action which is ordained, done by one undesirous of fruit, that is not desiring results, devoid of attachment, without love or hate, that is called pure. That is pure action. Uh, so it's a very different from mechanical action, isn't it? Very different something that we do again and again and again, and we don't really necessarily pay attention to it. We can think of that as action which has been made sacred, which is poised, which is free-flowing, which is not pulled by opposites. So desire does not um, sway one, take one away from performing an action to the best of one's ability. So we have pure action, uh, action which is really selfless, where there is no desire for results. <clears throat> the potential fruits of an action which entice us might include things such as payment or position or uh, receiving appreciation, receiving recognition, these sorts of things. <clears throat> but these are all things which uh, are wanted by our personal self. They are not uh, indicative of pure action. So the question therefore arises, well, why undertake any action at all, therefore? Brother Sri Ram says, action needs to be undertaken for its own sake. Act for the sake of acting, not for results. He adds that it is an extremely rare individual who can act with great intensity, force and enthusiasm without desiring anything for himself, even for secret personal gratification. And this is true enough. It, it would be extremely rare uh, to find such an individual who could act with such purity and just act for the sake of acting with that enthusiasm, but without any ambition for results. He wrote, performance of right action implies the presence of wisdom. In this case, then the action is beautiful. Then there is love. Then there is action with one's whole being. Then there is intensity. So right action and wisdom go together. An artist, uh, for example, might become totally absorbed in the process of what they are doing and maybe in that moment acting with great purity. And sometimes this is reflected also in the beautiful art we see in some temples uh, or in some of the Christian churches as well in different places. There is this be great beauty there and uh, one can imagine that at the moment of producing this art, there was great purity uh, of action on the part of the uh, 
the artist. So if we can focus on the process rather than outcomes, then life really has a different fragrance to it. So we don't anticipate, we don't expect, we don't create some sort of anxiety about whether or not something will be well received. We just do that action to the best of our ability and then let it go. We now come to an interesting distinction and that is the distinction between wisdom on one hand and knowledge on the other hand. Um, Brother Sri Ram wrote that wisdom which is essential for right action does not lie in mere knowledge. He said knowledge is of facts which are actual things. We can know certain facts in our life in the world as well and we do need to know facts of different kinds in order to function from day to day. But he said it is how one responds to facts which determines whether one is wise or unwise. So we have facts on the one hand and or knowledge if you like and wisdom on the other. He said that knowledge tends to be fragmentary. It may become stale and is time bound. Uh, something which in, is fragmentary exists in lots of different parts, if you like. They're not drawn together. And this is very much the nature of the knowledge available, much of the knowledge available in the world today. When we think about uh, the online ability uh, that so many of us have to simply uh, click in a term and then do a search and obtain bits of knowledge. There are many, many bits of knowledge around, but they may indeed have this fragmentary quality to them. But on the other hand, wisdom is a certain way of responding to facts, which is synthesizing, fresh, and timeless. So wisdom tends to bring things together. It, it, it sees the whole. It doesn't get uh, preoccupied with the parts. And now we come to something which I, I refer to as the gap. On the one hand, it's one thing to read or talk about the wisdom teachings, theosophical teachings, which may not become much more than a kind of knowledge, just some more mental knowledge of ideas. On the other hand, these teachings only become dynamic, they are only put into action when we really engage with those teachings, uh, when we reflect on them, when we take them in, when we assimilate them, and when there is a real passion to allow them to permeate our lives at every level. So this is a very important thing. And I, I think probably um, many, many people have contradictions. There are things which they talk about, for example, uh, certain aspects of the divine wisdom, uh, and they speak about that with great knowledge. But when it comes to daily life, they may fall short of actually living up to that. Uh, and therefore, uh, the wisdom is not yet there to actually bring it into action. The fact is we can get very comfortable. Uh, Brother Sri Ram mentioned addictions to physical or mental comfort and not liking to be disturbed from either of these. And there is truth in that. So many people love to be comfortable mentally with their ideas, with their view of the world um, or physically. Uh, and uh, that can create almost a kind of laziness in a way so that there is not the uh, real attention and interest in uh, discovering more about the world. He wrote that we are happy when we are in flow. We are happy 
when we are in flow. Happiness is an important subject in its own right. He referred here to a deep happiness when we are in a state of harmony, which we may all also refer to as joy. Uh, the theosophical author, Dr. Hugh Shearman, uh, wrote a book in which he contrasted fulfillment on the other hand, on the one hand, to desire on the other. Uh, and he said, that, and this is really another way of thinking about this distinction between passing happiness and deep joy. One relates to desire and the other is deeper again. There is a real deep fulfilment in this joy. He said the first glimpse of an entirely new kind of fulfilment is only a beginning. There's a long journey before an individual is wholly given over to this new fulfilment. It is a long journey, he said, before wisdom flowers as a constant state of being with this sense of flow, with this sense of harmony. So in the meantime, we might have breakthroughs to, to wisdom uh, at times, but again, it's a very rare individual who would have wisdom as a constant state of being. Now we're going to turn to devotion. We read that both wisdom and action, that is beautiful and right, have as their common basis the quality of love. He says love is the basis of devotion. Uh, one of the things uh, which I found very beautiful when living in India was the, uh, the devotion that was so obvious uh, in many places around uh, as one travelled through India. Uh, that was a very special thing. So, so love was very strong. It, it was a, an elevated kind of love. Uh, Brother Sri Ram began discussion on this particular yoga the yoga of devotion by distinguishing between loyalty on the one hand and true devotion on the other, which he wrote involves renunciation. He said loyalty is an attitude of mind, often with some sort of expectation of a benefit. For example, a religiously inclined person may also concentrate on an object of devotion, often with the idea of receiving a blessing of some sort. So devotion was there hoping for a blessing. Uh, so this is loyalty for a consideration, loyalty hoping to get something in return. He remarked that expectation exists in the devotion of most people. So in other words, uh, he was observing that most people's devotion is not pure because there was this hope of receiving something, this hope of reward uh, somewhere. So it's um, an extraordinary state to be truly pure. Uh, and it's, it's something which one comes to over uh, really many, many lives. And there may be a case of dipping one's toe in the water, as it were, uh, and experiencing it a little bit and then taking the toe out of the water until uh, gradually there is a greater emotion, uh, immersion rather in this higher state. On the other hand, he said that devotion occurs in its fullness, in all its glory and beauty, when there is total renunciation of self. So one has to be a renunciate in order to truly be devoted. 
and this opens the heart to the divine in everything, not just to a particular form. There's only love and there is no self. Brother Sri Ram then quoted a statement from the Christian tradition, which echoes the fundamental teaching of the Bhagavad Gita of not being attracted to the fruit of the action. And this statement reads, who will serve God for naught? In other words, who will serve God for nothing in return? So we see this parallel in the Christian tradition as well in this respect. Then a little further on comes a challenging passage from the Bhagavad Gita, which indicates really part of what it is to be a true devotee. It says, alike towards friend and foe, in honour and dishonour, friendly and compassionate, etc., are marks of a true devotee. Love is not rooted in the self. That is, love is not rooted in the personal nature. There is no expectation. One is alike towards friends as towards someone who uh, others may think is our enemy. So there is this great equanimity. There is this love for all, which is really quite beautiful. Uh, and, of course, he, he mentions this, uh, this quotation from the, at, at the feet of the master, or rather at the feet of the master, includes this well-known quotation of all the qualifications. Love is the most important, for if it is strong enough in a man, it forces him to acquire all the rest. The rest means the other qualifications of discrimination, desirelessness and good conduct. So if love is strong enough, then uh, the others, the other qualities come along with it. And all the rest, he said, without it uh, would never be sufficient. That was at the feet of the master. So love is fundamental. It's incredibly important. Um, wisdom, uh, one of the differences between wisdom and knowledge is that wisdom is something which involves love as well. The heart and the mind are both there in a state of wisdom. So uh, it's, it's very, very important. It's quite beautiful. We move on. Sri Krishna Prem wrote that the best and easiest means to make the ascent on the path is through loving devotion. The great force, he said, which will carry the disciple out of himself. Love is the power by which we rise, whether that love be of the true or of the beautiful, or best of all, of the one Atman, Krishna, who shines through everything men love or worship. So love of Krishna uh, is, is really uh, the best of all, he says, in this regard, in terms of love. So we go on. Authentic love is literally transformative and a pure heart forms part of the sure, firm basis upon which we can safely proceed in the spiritual life. True devotion is love suffused with the loveliness of the qualities of the object of devotion. And this is quite a beautiful statement, really. So when, when one is really devoted to um, an object, then one responds inwardly to the qualities in that object of devotion. There's this inner response, uh, which is really quite beautiful. The relationship between love and action is also explored in this chapter. We read that without love, there cannot be that fullness of action which arises from the depth, but only partial action. So when we, th we were talking before about um, 
really acting in a, in a technical way or acting more fully. So that fullness of action is something which occurs when love is there. It gives action a completely different quality. Brother Sri Ram wrote, the spiritual nature is something unique and apart, which manifests only when all that the world believes in, seeks and prizes is given up, not outwardly or ostentatiously, but utterly and in one's heart. And here we come across the famous quotation from the Mahatma letters, come out of your world into ours. Uh, as Brother Sri Ram mentioned, it does not mean that we have to go to Tibet or whatever, but it is about ceasing to be a creature of the world, ceasing to be worldly, living a life of pure altruism based on truth. And again and again in this text, we can see uh, that, that these teachings are really sublime the, the insights that he provides throughout this book are sublime and and they are really if you like up there they are things that we can be inspired by and move towards so not being a creature of the world uh, it's not so easy to do because we live in this everyday world and we're surrounded by material things. But again and again, the challenge is every day to decide for ourselves how far we want to be a creature of the world, how far we want to engage with things material. We have almost reached the end of this chapter now in terms of the points that I wanted to highlight today. Uh, he wrote that the path calls for a complete revolution in oneself, a complete revolution. Uh, the revolution is a, a kind of a metamorphosis. Uh, you know how a, a caterpillar spins a, a cocoon and then this butterfly eventually emerges. There's this complete transformation. Uh, that is uh, a physical analogy of the uh, how dramatic the transformation is in this particular context. He said this metamorphosis is alchemical in nature. It produces the pure gold of what we really are, which is the pure gold of the universe rather than something to be admired or something to appropriate, something to take. So we'll just summarise now the main ideas dealt with from this chapter of the book. We began by considering yoga and yoga as union uh, and the, the kind of wholeness that goes with being in a state of yoga. We talked about action, we talked about action which is mechanical uh, compared with pure action, action with no desire for its fruit, completely selfless action. We considered the difference between wisdom and knowledge. They are two quite different things. We also considered the gap between knowledge of the teachings and how we actually live because living up to those teachings in day-to-day -day life uh, is an adventure in itself. We considered the distinction between loyalty on the one hand, which might want some sort of reward, and true selfless devotion. Uh, we considered uh, love and how it is transformative, and when it's suffused with the qualities of the object of devotion, then it becomes true devotion. And then finally, the path as a complete revolution in oneself. Thank you so much, Sister Linda, for such a beautiful 
composed and detailed lecture so now i would like to open the forum for any questions answers or suggestions you can raise your electronic hand or put up the question in chat brother basvaraj reddy has written love wisdom and action which are at its purest level are to be discovered by the creator of the world on its own to reach the highest thank you yes um it's true enough that we are creatures of the world really uh, we we are this is where uh our daily challenges lie uh, we live in this world we breathe in this world we act in this world all of that and and this is where we need to really work from and uh pure love pure wisdom pure action are things that we need to to work from uh towards really uh from where we are now we we if we really want to if we've been a bit half hearted we can begin right now and resolve that we are going to make certain changes in our life for example um it's very easy to put things off it's very easy in the spiritual life to say well i won't manage this in this life in my next life i will do such and such uh and that can become an excuse for not really acting when we have the opportunity because really to come into contact with precious teachings such as the teachings one finds in the whole um body of theosophical literature both classical and modern to come into contact with that is a very special opportunity in a series of lifetimes and uh perhaps if we don't take take this up strongly enough in this lifetime we may not come across them again for some time in the future uh but but in any case it's it's good for us to from time to time make a change to use the will to to resolve to be determined uh to uh live a little bit differently and by working at this regularly day by day week by week month by month year by year uh sometimes over time it is surprising the the changes that may come about when we weren't even realizing what was happening so mom um... thank you so if nobody is raising hand that means the lecture was so clear that there is no doubt left i do encourage all of you who have not really looked at this book seeking wisdom to obtain a copy of it 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 is full of gems full of full of pearls really you can read through a chapter and then um find that there are a number of things that you want to to stay with to sit with to reflect on and uh these are the sorts of things that help to elevate the consciousness we can become very uh bogged down in mundane things in day to day life and uh it's important to to have these points of elevation of consciousness many people might meditate or pray uh but also the mind needs elevating things to work with as well uh, madam blavatsky used to talk about um the need to steep our thing ourselves in things divine which is to immerse ourselves in divine things 
And if uh, even a little each day we can immerse ourselves in something which um, really partakes of the divine in some way, then it, it gradually changes us. I often think of us as being like the water in, in a bucket and the water in the bucket, which is us, is a particular kind of colour. But then with every little change that we make, every, every little thing that helps to make us a little bit purer, it's like getting a dropper and adding a, a little bit of uh, nicer colour to that water. And, and eventually when this total transformation has taken place, the, the water would have an intense purity to it. And I think it, it's something that needs to be worked on a little bit but steadily, a little bit on a regular basis. I think everyone is uh, introspecting themselves. Yes, Brother Pradeep, do you want to say something? No, I think uh, as there is no question, no thing to add. So then we can share something and uh, have a little early break. Sure, so sure. Can sure. Start I, by the way, I would like to uh, thank the Indian section for the opportunity to give these sessions and uh, uh, hope they have been useful in some way. Yes, ma'am. Now, Bimalji raised her hand. Yeah, so since you invited us to share. So actually, when you, uh, Linda, when you mentioned about that uh, person who was uh, the president of his lodge and sweeping the floor. Now, I was, um, I went back to my early days in the Theosophical Society. And uh, when I used to go to Adyar, I know every, every Sunday or every alternate Sunday, there would be a group of people serving snacks, samosas and tea. And uh, they would they would be the best of snacks, you know. They, they, those samosas were from some expensive place. They were not just off the street, and nobody would ask us any money for anything. And I would see, you know, a week after week, the smiling faces of people serving, and nobody wanted any commitment from me for being part of the society. Nobody wanted anything from me. Neither did they ask me to volunteer. No, that kind of selflessness uh, really drew me to the society. I would say it was the people there. It's not just one face. I saw so many faces like that, who were like that. And they may not even know my name, but they serve. They don't know that I exist, but they still stood there and politely asked me. With So, you know, this is, uh, I think, the essence of uh, the members of the Theosophical Society that over time, one learns this um, uh, this this kind of uh, nis, nis, uh, nish karma karma they call it. That is uh, work which is which is selfless work or uh, uh, some desireless work. Nish, yeah. nish karma karma. Yeah, that's it's a wonderful concept, and uh, this is the thing with wisdom. Wisdom is something which we can discern in another through the quality of their actions. And I'm very interested to know that this is what helped to draw you to the Theosophical Society. When, when people are asked this question, uh, many people have different answers about why they belong to the society. For some, it is freedom of thought. For some, it is the, the brotherhood or this or that. But... Um, I, I think that this uh, resonance to uh, really true service uh, is an in, in a resonance on your part to, to something quite profound, really, because if one thinks about um, the whole um, long-term evolution of humanity and, and what makes a fully realised human being, uh, it's a human being who is not centered on themselves ultimately but centered centered in uh, everywhere in a sense really uh, who has this concern for the greater whole and 
um, this this is really part of our journey and and uh, sometimes our heart responds to something um, which is resonant with that in another. Uh, yes, our brother Chitendra Sampath is also raising hand. Yeah, um, I wanted to share something because I was told to find something for two, three minutes to say something about this program. I'm very grateful to all concerned in the Indian section uh, to have such a to have such a study class. Uh, it's a, such a wonderful program. Uh, and thanks to Linda, brother, sister Linda and brother Pedro for uh, their great service shared to us all. We may have, we may have uh, uh, such... Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, sir, but if the rest of the participants would kindly unmute, unmute their microphones. <laughs> So we will have a break, then uh, in the end, you can share it. Yes, sir. So, uh, thank you so much, Sister Linda. It was a lovely session. And the way you make it sound so composed, it's like a po poetry going on. Thank you so much. So now we'll have a short break and then we'll be back by 10.05 with another session which will be taken by Brother Pedro. So now you can all enjoy the music. Brother Pradeep, kindly share that.
तेरा मंगल तेरा मंगल तेरा मंगल हो रे सबका मंगल सबका मंगल सबका मंगल हो रे जिस गुरुदेव ने धर्म दिया है उनका मंगल हो रे जिस जननी ने जन्म दिया है उसका मंगल हो रे पाला पोसा बड़ा किया उस पिता का मंगल हो इस जगत के सब दुखियारे प्राणी का मंगल हो रे जल में स्थल में और गगन में सब का मंगल हो रे अंतर मन की गांठे टूटे अंतर राग द्वेश और मोह मिट जाए शील समाधि हो रे शुद्ध धर्म धरती पर जागे पाप पराजित हो रे इस धरती के तर तिन में कण कण में धर्म समो रे शुद्ध धर्म जन जन में जाग घर घर में शांति समो रे तेरा मंगल मेरा मंगल सब का मंगल हो रे सब का मंग गल हो रे सब का मंगल हो Yes, Kritika, we will back. So, yes, welcome Kritika. back, everybody, to the session two. Now I would like to invite Brother Pedro Oliveira for taking the session. So over to you, Brother. Thank you, Kritika. Um, I would like to begin with a story. Um, there may be no time to have a story at the end, so I'll begin with the story. Um, this was included in an article in a tribute article to Radha G in The Theosophist, which was published in February, um, 2014. Uh, we had a number of conversations over the years and, and um, uh, she said that um, the last time Krishna G had visited Adyar was in 1933 uh, when Dr. Annie Besant passed away. So he was there to pay his respects to her. She was a very special person in his life. And circumstances were such that uh, he didn't feel welcome to uh, visit again. I won't go into such details. And, um, but, but when Radha Ji uh, uh, became 
uh, elected president of the TS. He, he was very fond of her and he, he did visit that yard and quite a number of people were at the main gate, including one of his tutors in 1909, Russell Balfour Clark. But there were others as well, including um, Mrs. Mary Zimbalist, who is a, a long friend, long time friend of Krishnamurti, the vice president at that time, Mr. Surendra Narayan and many others. So he entered the gate and uh, he wanted to walk. So he walked with Radhaji and others to her house. And some of you may know that her house is located by the sea, Parsi quarters. She said he, he walked very vigorously and he was 85. That was in 1980. He was 85. And um, then they reached her house and she gave him some orange juice and so on. There were other people there as well from the Krishnamurti Foundation. Uh, he wanted to pay a visit to the Garden of Remembrance, which was erected uh, uh, in memory of Dr. Besant after she passed away. And he spent some time there. Then the car, the Krishnamurti Foundation car came to pick him up and um, and Radhaji drove with him. Uh, and, and when they, are, they were reaching, about to reach the main gate, he asked her, what are you going to do now? And she said, I'm going to walk back. He said, no, we'll take you back. So the car turned around and started uh, its journey towards Parsi quarters. And as the car turned around, he turned to her and, she, and he said, uh, Radhaji, do you believe in the masters? And uh, it was quite a, a surprising question. She said, yes. And, and then he became slightly more intense and he said, what do you mean by yes? Do you know that Dr. Bezan's life was entirely different because of it? And then the, she said there was a silence for a little while. And then he asked again, do you believe in the masters? And she said, yes, I do. And the only thing he said was good. And I wanted to, make, to mention this because books have been written, articles have been written, things have been said over the years saying that um, uh, Krishnamurti didn't accept the idea of the masters, they may, overinterpreted what he said in the early days. But uh, this is the testimony of Radhaji, of course. And this has something to do with the theme of the chapter 12, the real and the unreal. And um, uh, for example, um, in the very last letter that uh, was received from the Mahatmas, and that was addressed to Dr. Rani Besson in August 1900. The master said that the constant repetition of their names disturbed their work, and they work silently and anonymously. And, and they said something which is very important. How few are those who can know anything about us? And yet, we had a lot of claims. The history of the society is full of claims of individuals that said that they have contacted the masters and so on. Uh, but that was the spirit in which they work. They, they didn't care for the attention of the world. They didn't want to impress people. They would come closer to people who were ready to help them in their work they wouldn't concede special benefits just for conceding special benefits. They would give opportunities to people. A number of people to whom they gave opportunities, they didn't uh, come up to the task and things happen in their lives and so on. But uh, both Radhaji and Brother Sri Ram were convinced that uh, uh, Krishnaji was doing the master's work in his own way. 
So what we have to deal now in the book, Seeking Wisdom, is the, the question of the real and the unreal. And the first uh, passage that I would like to highlight is, does reality lie in a feeling that springs up from within, either in relation to the things of the external world or even independently of them as an inner experience, if that is possible, or does it consist in the actual existence of those things? Um, and he's going to examine this question in great depth during this chapter. Um, um, uh, so the feeling of reality, uh, um, although there is a certain feeling of reality in the experience that we have, but if, if the experience are filtered by a personal self, they may not be real. They may be conditionally real and not real per se. He also says that there are so many things around us which are real enough, nevertheless, we seek a reality apart from them. That is because our experience of things, our contact with the world around us, including all persons and things, leaves us empty and unsatisfied. Um, um, so, and this is very interesting. Um, that according to the teachings of the Gita, the mind of a yogi is like a lamp in a windless place. It is unaffected by the wind. It's unaffected by, therefore, by experiences. It remains the same. Stitta pragna. We have mentioned that before. But our minds, which are governed by the personal self, they are always searching for new experiences. And behind this search for new experiences is this very deep-seated desire of full, for fulfillment. But as the Buddha very rightly put, this is the process which generates suffering. Uh, Dr. Walpura Raula, a very great scholar of Buddhism from Sri Lanka, he had a, a dialogue or two with Mr. Krishnamurti uh, in London. And, and they were having this dialogue and suddenly Dr. Raula said, sir, I don't want to continue this conversation because I know that you have realized the truth. I want you to tell me now what is truth, which, what, it, which was... Uh, uh, um, shocked those other fellow uh, members of the dialogue panel. And Krishna Ji said, okay, sir, let, let us have, uh, let us answer your question directly. Where you are, truth is not. In, in other words, where the personal self is, truth is not. It becomes a blockage to truth because the personal self is a creature of desire, of wanting. Um, and Dr. Walpola Raula in his book, What the Buddha Taught, very recommended, perhaps it should be in every theosophical library, he said that the word dukkha, which is translated by uh, suffering, he said suffering is not the best translation because what the word really conveys is frustration. This is what, this is what the personal self does. It goes after experiences and more experiences and more experiences, <coughs> sorry, but it's always frustrated and therefore it generates suffering, not only for itself, but for others. 
So there are experiences that are real and the, the experiences which are real, they independ, they are independent from the self in us because they are a direct contact. For example, a real mystical experience is real. Why? Because it exists in the present moment. One of the great theologians of the Western world was St. Thomas Aquinas. Anyone who studies theology or philosophy comes up with him. And he was a, a, a great intellect. He studied the philosophy of Aristotle and he legitimated the philosophy, the, the, he legitimated the Christian teachings, the Christian scriptures through the logic of Aristotle. But at the end of his life, he had a mystical experience. The word mystic comes from a Greek word muon, which means to close the lips and the eyes. A mystical experience is therefore untranslated and whatever the mystic experience at that moment, he cannot fully explain because it doesn't happen within the sphere of the personal mind. It is a very profound life altering experience. So St. Thomas Aquinas had such an experience and according to his biographer who, is also, who was also his friend, after that the experience he ceased to preach, he ceased to teach at the university, uh, he ceased to attend church services, he went into a monastery and, and eventually he died. But before he entered the monastery, he confided in his, to his friend what he had experienced. And he said, everything that I have written can be compared to straw in the light of what I saw. This, ex, this description fits completely well with the description of Buddha in the Mahatma letters. The suggestion there is that when Buddha manifests in the, in, on manas, that means the, the mind principle, it completely, it brings into silence to realization, not to discourse, not to chattering, not to personal opinions. All these die because of that experience. Um, and, and, and then Sri Ram suggests that, um, um, that the bearer in us is ourselves is the way we look at ourselves. If we continue to look at ourselves as an independent self, ego, this process will go on until we die and it will continue when we come back to incarnation. This is what is called samsara, aimless wandering. That's the nature of the self. It keeps wandering, wandering aimlessly. It doesn't know a real direction in life. And Brother Sri Ram says, this barrier divides us from the things and persons to whom we are physically, but from the psychological point of view, inadequately related. And, and, and Mr. Krishnamurti went into the question of relationship very deeply. He talked about the mirror of relationships. If we want to know ourselves, we have to look the way we relate to people, what we do, what we don't do. Why do we impose ourselves on others? Why do we think highly of ourselves? Or why do we condemn ourselves all the time, saying that we are a loser? This is a very popular concept in pop culture today, loser or losers. In, in some sense, everybody is a loser because if we don't find this authentic experience, we have lost something. And this is 
this is the notion behind the Holy Grail. The, the Holy Grail suggests that something precious has been lost. Some authors have gone into this very deeply. And what has been lost is the Holy Grail. That means this vessel within us, the higher aspect of our minds that can receive the light of Buddha. And, 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 and when that light pours through this vessel, the individual experiences a complete regeneration and therefore all his relationships are regenerated. It has been said that when the Buddha visits Sri Lanka, I have seen one stupa commemorating there, he brought with him 500 arhats. And some scholars have suggested that the number of arhats increased because he was present. He, his field of wisdom, his field of compassion was so profound that he helped in the transformation of other people, even of criminals like the story of Angulimala mentions. Angulimala was a, a thief and a murderer who would rob people and from every person he robbed, he would cut off a finger and would put the finger in his mala. So Angulimala, you can Google him. So he knew that the Buddha was a special person or well-known person and he reached the camp where the Buddha was at night. He was determined to rob the Buddha and chop one of his fingers. But tradition says that when he came within the field of Buddha's consciousness, he immediately realized that what he was doing was wrong and he dropped it. He didn't think about it, he dropped it. And Tradition says he became one of the disciples of the Buddha. So this is the greatness of individuals who have attained inner spiritual regeneration. They could not only inspire others, but they could open others' minds and hearts to the possibility of regeneration. The testimonies about Jesus are the same. The testimony of St. Paul is very, very moving because he was employed by the governor of Judea to hunt Christians and arrest them and bring them to justice because they were considered troublemakers at that time. So he went in many places, he arrested quite a number of Christians and he decided to go to Damascus, which today is in Syria. Um, I don't think nowadays St. Paul would be able to go to Damascus and I don't need to give you details about it. So he was on the road to Damascus. His name was not Paul, his name was Saul of Tarsus. He was a, an educated Jew, he had studied Greek philosophy and so on. But his employment was a hunter of Christians. So he was on the road with some other fellow travelers. And he says that a light from heaven shone upon him. And it was so intense that threw him to the ground. And in the middle of that light, a voice spoke to him and said, So why does thou persecute me? And without any hesitation, Without any explanation or preparation, St. Paul replied, is that you, Lord? And the, the text of the Gospels indicates that the voice that spoke to him was Jesus, who had died three decades ago. He became completely blind by that experience. Madame Blavatsky says that that was indication of a very profound initiatory experience. He was taken to the house of a, 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 another disciple, Ananias. And after the three days, he recovered sight and he was not Saul anymore, he was Paul. So these experiences, they do exist. Some people may ask, why would Jesus give an opportunity to someone who was hunting Christians? We don't know. 
there was something in him that deserved that opportunity. Brother Shiran says, when a relationship is intimate and complete, one does not seek anything beyond it. If you are related to someone or to family members or friends, when the relationship is intimate and complete, you don't seek anything. If you seek more, then there is no completion. But also there is this desire for more, which is the self. In the Greek tradition, as I mentioned, the self is a friend of mine in Brisbane called it in Greek gorgons. They are monsters with tentacles. And that's what the self does. It tends to appropriate things. The self, the personal self is never present in the present moment. It is always seeking something else. Therefore it misses things, it misses precious things. Because relationship, love, beauty, affection, they only exist in the present moment. If they become part of your memory, then your memory will twist them, will mix them with other things. The, uh, yourself will treat those precious experiences as a computer file, either a PDF or a Word file or an Excel file. It becomes something mechanical. And that's how human relationships break up. They become mechanical. They don't have life in them. This knowing, which is not purely mental, which is a superficial and complete knowledge. Uh, uh, sorry, this knowing is not purely mental, which is a, a superficial and, and incomplete form of knowledge. Remember, I, I may have mentioned here that in a talk in, the, in New York, uh, Mr. Krishnamurti said, all knowledge is still within the field of ignorance, whatever it is because it's knowledge. And because the knowledge presupposes a known and a knower. And in the Mahatma letters, one of the adepts describes the completion, which is called adeptship, as the fusion of the known, the knower, and the knowledge. They become blended in one. They cease to be separate. The mind is the thinker, and thinking never brings us into intimate contact with anybody or anything. So we need the mind to deal with practical things of life. But if we deal with relationships only from a mental perspective, we are bound to disappointment, and we are going to disappoint others as well. As Jalaluddin Rumi said, we need wisdom. He said, wisdom is a mind, uh, wisdom is a mind that loves and a heart that sees. The mind has a knowledge or a knowing about things which is full of affection, reverence, love. And the, the, the mind, um, um, uh, the love has affections or um, aspirations which are not parochial, but which are universal. And this is what the human being is meant to unfold into, a complete blending of mind and heart. Madame Blavatsky called this buddhi manas. She said the ordinary mind of people is kama manas. It is a mind completely dominated by desire. Every aspect of the mind, every corner of the mind is dominated by desire. Desire also means self-interest. What is in this for me? Why should I join this venture? What kind of benefit will I infer from this? And this is happening in the world at a, at a global level. 
right? And then he says that this kind of mind, which is personal, which is limited, which is full of self-interest, uh, it, it is a kind of shadow play. The shadows being the images which keep the actual thing at a distance. And one of the great psychologists from the 20th century, Dr. Carl Gustav Jung, a Swiss doctor, had an enormous influence in Western culture. He coined this concept that every one of us has a shadow side. The shadow side in us is that uh, those aspects of us that we don't want to look at. And by not looking at, they get stronger and eventually they manifest in a crisis or in conflict in relationships or sadness or so and so on. And he suggests that the path of self-knowledge implies that we look at our shadows, we don't run away from them, and we understand our shadows. He mentioned in his writings that passage of the gospel when Jesus was meditating, meditating in a garden all alone, his disciples were not with him, and he was visited by the devil. The text of the scripture doesn't use the word the devil. It, it, the original word in Greek is adversary. That's what he is. So he came to Jesus and he took Jesus into a highest mountain and, and from where they could see the entire world. And then the adversary, the devil, uh, told uh, uh, Jesus, you see, all this can be yours if you join me. The devil, of course, it is the shadow side. The G Jesus didn't destroy the devil. He didn't shoot the devil away. The only thing he said to the adversary was, go thou behind me. In other words, he wouldn't allow that shadow side to interfere in the direction he is moving. And only a, a self-realized individual can do that. Um, Brother Sri Ram says, one does not love with the mind. It's a, it's a striking statement. One does not love with the mind. The capacity to love brings much more happiness, gives us more of a sense of reality, of an intimate feeling than thought. Happiness, beauty, love, all this belong to a different aspect of man's being from the mind which knows only the forms of things, not the essence. And yet most of our contacts, most of our interactions are through the medium of the mind. But if the mind is the medium, it's understandable that if you meet someone new, there may be some suspicion lurking in your mind. Who is this person? Why is he or she here? What do they intend? You know, it can be someone who comes with the proper references, to, so to speak. But this is one of the jobs that the mind attributes to itself, suspicion, which is a form of aggravated separateness. Right. This sometimes happens even between friends, between family members. And it's a denial of affection, it's a denial of love. Um, so uh, he, he suggests that the mind knows only the forms of things, not the essence. It cannot touch that which is profound. In the, in the words of the voice of the silence, there is the doctrine of the he head and the doctrine of the heart. 
The noctad of the head is intellectual, calculating, scholastic, mind-based. The, the doctrine of the heart is wisdom-based, compassion-based. What is called the subject, that means the, the consciousness, the subject is the knower, the lover, the actor, the experiencer, the one who responds. In the Bhagavad Gita, there is a chapter entitled, The Field and the Knower of the Field. And the word knower is used to denote the subject, which is consciousness. It is a very well-known chapter of the Gita. So, uh, uh, what really knows and what really loves is something much deeper than the mind. Um, there is one exercise that was suggested once many years ago. If you could think of the very first time you fell in love in this life, without necessarily articulating that because there is privacy involved. But if you think of the very first time you fell in love, it is possible that you will realize that in that feeling, there is something intangible about that. You cannot fully explain it. It's a very deep feeling. It has nothing to do with self-interest. It's nothing to do with pleasure as such but it is a feeling of love, of encounter between two people. Then he continues that uh, the unconditioned consciousness, which is consciousness in its purity, perceives only the truth of what is. It is like a perfect mirror which reflects accurately. It perceives not what should be, not what I want it to be, nor what it was, but what it is. Some Buddhist teachers have called this suchness. It is a perception of something in its own nature. And um, um, uh, in the tradition of Mullah Nasruddin, in one of the stories, he is on the banks of a very wide river and a man on the other side shouts at him and says, how do I get to the other shore? And Nasruddin says, don't worry, you are already there. And, and the, the lesson is that precisely where we are and who we are, this is what the path is. The path is not going away from ourselves, um, enter a, an ashram. And nowadays there are many ashrams in which you have to pay a good deal of money to enter them. In the West, there are more and more individuals that are claiming that they have everything you need to know, provide you pay something for them by PayPal. But this is not what the ancient teachings say. They say that the path is here and now. Nagarjuna had a way of saying this. Samsara is nirvana. Nirvana is samsara. Right in the middle of the limitation of samsara, there is, there is nirvana, if we knew how to look. I have to look about the time, yes. And then you, you remember that in the voice of the silence, there, is, there are several metaphors, as one of the metaphors is that the, the student, the aspirant, has to go to three holes. The hall, um, uh, uh, the hall of ignorance, the hall of learning, and the hall of wisdom. 
And this is what Mr. Shriram says. The subject which operates in this hall of ignorance and illusion, which is the world as it is, human life as it's being lived, it's not the pure subject. It is a considerably modified subject limited by the brain with which it identifies itself, modified by reactions and memories from the toils of which it does not withdraw itself. So, and that's why, that's why the teaching in the voice of the silence is that you have to get out of this hole. This hole is necessary, but you need to get out of this hole um, because it's a hole of illusion. It's a condition of illusion. Finally, He says, what we inwardly seek, though unconsciously, is peace, balance in our inner being, fullness, happiness, reality. But it's not attained because we do not understand ourselves and we engage in a chase which will not bring them about. These are the fundamental principles. Peace, balance, fullness, happiness, balance in our inner being, fullness, happiness, reality. Um, and yet, what we end up seeking is position, power, possessions, pleasures, and so forth. All are evanescent, and when they stay, they become stale and wearisome. I would like to again thank the Indian section and brother Pradeep Mahapatra for the invitation to participate in this uh, study camp. And I wish you well in your lives and study. Thank you so much, brother Pedro, for such a detailed presentation of, and for sharing so many experiences with us. So now I would like to open the forum for questions and answers. Or any suggestions? Anybody who wants to ask any question can either raise their electronic hand or put up the question in chat box. And I see Sister Rimal raising hand. Uh, so you mentioned regarding the uh, the esoteric side of Krishnamurti or the, the whether he acknowledged the masters in his life in your in the early part of your talk. So regarding this, uh, there is a book called The Inner Life of Krishnamurti, Private Passion, Perennial Wisdom by Ariel Sanath. And it was, it was published in 1999 by Quest Publications. Uh, it is available for free online uh, in Z library, Z library. And uh, I've been reading it and there's plenty of times Krishnamurti has mentioned the masters and given several different names also to them. And uh, in, in fact, in your talk, you mentioned a lot about Christ. So uh, uh, in, in this book, uh, Krishnamurti is also mentioned that what has happened, what happened to Krishnamurti in this life happened to Christ also in the same way that uh, Christ was an ordinary human being through which uh, the Lord Maitreya spoke. So uh, I don't know whether you're aware of this book. I thought I'd just uh, share it with you. I have a copy, and uh, I, I, uh, we welcome uh, Mr. Sanat in Australia for a lecture tour, and I discuss with him his book, and uh, he is writing more books now. Uh, and one of the articles, which is also online, is called Krishnamurti, The Secret Doctrine and Transformation. And he relates some of the, fun, the core teachings of Krishnamurti with some core teachings of the secret doctrine. It's available online. Oh, okay. So, so in that case, uh, then the question comes to me as a, uh, maybe I'm just a new neophyte or whatever you call it. But why then do we discuss so much about uh, books which were written 
by theosophists and not enough about Krishnamurti's books because or his thoughts or his lectures because uh, in fact like for example everything that you talked about today could be solved by when you talk about the self could be solved by saying that we don't we shouldn't build images that's the simple uh, thing that that Krishnamurti said which is whenever we create images we 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 attract all kinds of things so uh, but when we when the teaching when a newer version of the teaching is available sir why do we you know refer so much to the older version of uh, anibesant or you know the oh, the other versions so that's a question which is very like it's very prominent in my mind and i haven't found anybody giving me a proper answer for this the first point to be noted is that Madame Blavatsky, she was a very extraordinary person. In an article of 1889, she said, the Theosophical Society does not teach anything, does not believe in anything, does not accept anything. The Theosophical Society does not, does not have an official teaching, but it encourages its members to explore, to study. Why should we draw a line? Of course, uh, there were a number of members in 1929 and later who were very upset with Krishnamurti because they had this expectation that he would be announced as the world teacher and he would be behaving like the world teacher. But the expect expectation was in their minds only. And gradually the society mature, got away from that mindset. But if you take a book like uh, The World Around Us by Radhaji, she quotes the Buddha, Krishnamurti, Jesus, Sri Ramana Maharshi, um, scientists, you know, that this is part of a theosophical attitude. You don't limit your search only in a certain book. And there are Krishnamurti groups, uh, study groups functioning in several lodges around the world. In Australia, at least three, and they are exploring his teachings. And sometimes um, there are presentations as well. So the interest in his teaching is very much alive here in other places as well. Um, um, but um, Annie Besant, for example, she said um, they wanted her to conform to what Madame Blavatsky had written. And she said, she was an independent woman. She, she thought independently. She said, if we do that, we are no more than parents. Why should we endlessly quote someone? We have to investigate. And that's what she did. And if you take a book like this, A Study of Consciousness by Annie Besson, it's a very profound book. And and all these questions are addressed there, the nature of desire, the nature of attachment, the nature of how the self generates illusion, it's all there. So the society doesn't have any official teaching, but it encourages its members to go very deeply into all these teachings and, and it doesn't label them either. Thank you. I hope I have not upset you. No, no, I, I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I asked this question because it requires some courage for me to ask you this question. Because, uh, yeah, it, it's a troublesome question. And, um, uh, yeah, I understand this part that what you say that we don't want to draw lines. And anybody who's studying Krishnamurti might tend to draw a line. Because when he talks about authority, then immediately you put aside everybody who is in a position of authority talking. So that becomes a little bit of a contradiction. But when you are trying to bridge this gap, and the peculiar thing about Ariel Sanat's book is when he mentions theosophists all the time in the book, uh, he, he, he doesn't realize that today's theosophists talk a lot more about Krishnamurti than those theosophists back then. So uh, there is a... Uh, that that book also needs to be updated because today's theosophists are not the theosophists he might have met or even the Krishnamurti or who Krishnamurti might have met. Today's theosophists are very different. Like you said, we are studying Krishnamurti all the time. But yes, this, uh, this, this keeping our legs in two boats, one Krishnamurti and one theosophy, uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult balance. Uh, 
because on one hand what you said today sir like for example the buddhi manas versus the karma manas what profound learning this is uh, but then one one who's a krishnamurti fan will try to understand it in krishnamurti's language how would krishnamurti put this or are we then dividing ourselves are we fragmenting ourselves so these kind of thoughts come i suggest we don't label people uh, the society doesn't label teachings it doesn't label people we seek, seek to realize the universal brotherhood of humanity rather ji used to say the first object of the society points to a mind without barriers completely free unconditioned so and then and we are all students and uh, yeah is there any que- uh, critica is there anybody else there uh no brother not yet can i go <laughs> there is some okay so um, jitendra will speak something yes brother. um thank you brother pedro for your lecture now i would like to invite brother jitendra for few words um can you hear me now i think my phone was on that's why there was a humming going on when i was talking earlier so if it's clear so i'm very grateful to all the concerned in the indian section especially pradeep and to have a, such a study class and to linda and pedro a very good, thankful to you both of you we have done a tremendous amount of good work uh, service shared to us all we may have no such uh, programs but with a little suggestion that all participants have the chosen book they should be having the chosen book so they should have read it earlier before the program so suppose we select another book next time let the participants have a copy of this book as linda also suggested now that everybody should have that seeking wisdom and go through it again so when we are participating let's have a book in advance and we read it also so we can contribute something rather than having questions and answers session because we didn't have any questions and answers this session so that this this is a period that that time can be used for sharing their contribution and their understanding because what is important is understanding rather than having a uh, knowledge um i love the chapter on the knowledge and the difference between the hearing and listening uh pedro gave a very good example uh, about this so people do hear sounds but they don't listen <laughs> that was a good part about it then the on the knowledge and wisdom this i always uh, bring it up in my in our lodge about person who is very knowledgeable very intellectual is a walking dictionary is a walking encyclopedia but has no common sense has no wisdom uh, he misappropriates uh, funds he is a rationalist in and then what's in what's meaning of having that knowledge you know but it doesn't you know he, he discriminates and sees different people differently um on the devotion one who devotes his time and money for others to uplift is more devotional than to praying to jesus or, or krishna or, or or so forth uh, that's that is not a devotion but this devotion of seeing uh, to see if he spends money and time uh, with others then on the uh, very very interesting that jk krishnamurti has uh, said something very very important and i've been changed completely transformation has come in to me by reading one sentence three words only um uh, he says that uh, if you regard yourself as russian american indian or african 
or as a Christian or Muslim or a Hindu, you are being violent. So he says, destruction of separateness, those three words, destruction of separateness. If it comes into somebody's mind, he will never become a racialist or a, uh, identifying as a personality. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. So now I would like to invite brother Ganesh Kumar from New Zealand. Thank you so much for all those involved. Thank you for making it available to all of us. Thank you for the best. Thank you, sir. Uh, do we have uh, Professor Shinde? Okay, so now I would like to invite Brother Pradeep. Okay, you have uh, met and me. Thank you very much. And may uh, all the I pay my gratitude to all the participants from India and outside India, as well as to both the directors. For the two weeks, they have given their time as well as their uh, knowledge, wisdom to us, to share us. More important things, if we uh, study and think over it, then these intellectual things we have, which we, which we have gathered from the books and the knowledge, then we can uh, convert it into wisdom. The, there are some of points which are very touching to our own heart. I am quoting it for uh, a few points, important points. If you die every moment, there is no death when it actually occurs. All vices from self, all vices come from self, but all virtues from truth. Third point. Theosophical society is not a belief-based organization, but inquiry-based organization. Then fourth, those who knows do not speak. Those who do not know do not speak. Then Brother, Brother Pedro mentioned a very interesting sentence. Very few things matters. Most things do not matter at all. Then uh, he also mentioned policy of pleasing another in our day-to-day -day life is a way of another selfishness. Then he mentioned to be a learned is to be present where he is. Then Brother Pedro mentioned, if you are in real dhana, there is no thought. Then where one reached the perfection, there is no known, knowing or known. Then uh, towards the end he quoted, Mullah Nasruddin, who want to go to other soul. Then Mullah said, the path is, or Mullah says, you are already there, you are already in the other soul. So the path is what you are, where you are now. Path is here and now. Nagarjuna says, Sansara is Nirvana. Nirvana is sansar. So these are the few touching sentences uh, which touch my heart. So I press before you. Thank you, sir. I was thankful to both the directors for their nice presentation, for the members, as well as the members, non-members are there. Also, the members from the outside India. Thank you. Over to Pritika. Thank you so much, Brother Pradeep.
thank you so much brother petro sister linda for being there for delivering such nice thoughts and lectures and we'll be waiting to see you both soon again and uh, now i would like to invite sister mitalini for the closing prayer namaste to all ಶತಮಸದ್ಗಮಯ ತಮಸು ಮ್ಯೋತಿರ್ಗಮಯ ಮೃತ್ಯುರ್ಮ ಅಮೃತಂಗಮಯ ಸರ್ಪೆ ಪವಂತು ಸುಖಿನ ಸರ್ಪೆ ಸಂತು ನಿರಾಮಯ ಸರ್ಪೆ ಭದ್ರಿ ಪಶ್ಯಂತು ನಾಕಿತ್ ದುಃಖಭಾಗ್ಭವೆ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 thank you so much once again brother petro and sister linda and thank you to all the participants who joined and thank you for everyone for making this possible so let's meet another time same place till then please be safe and enjoy every day bye bye